So here we go. Um, good uh, afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this uh, second of our public update meetings. Um, we have got um, quite a full agenda in a relatively short period of time, um, but I'd like to welcome um, some guests um, and thank them very much for coming um, today. So we have um, uh, Richard Flinton from the local authority, uh, and we have Sarah Hill from our domestic abuse charity, uh, IDAS, um, as well as uh, policing and fire colleagues. So uh, welcome and thank you very much uh, for coming um, here. Um, so first of all, uh, Lisa, I'm going to start with you, if that's all right. Could you do a very quick run through of, uh, of the sort of policing response in, in North Yorkshire? Absolutely, yes. So um, here in North Yorkshire Police's area, we are continuing with uh, the structure that was in place when we last spoke to you two weeks ago. So we still have our full structure of our local resilience forum, uh, then supported by uh, wider multi-agency groups that are working together in partnership with health, local authority, fire and rescue service and others, uh, meeting on a regular basis. So all of those different elements of supporting the community are still joined up and running as they were two weeks ago. In terms of policing specifically, uh, we've continued to adopt um, the engagement, explain the government guidelines and encourage people uh, so that the whole um, stance here is to encourage the public and the community to work alongside us as partnership agencies uh, to prevent the spread of the virus, uh, to protect the NHS and to save lives. So that is still the overwhelming policing response here in North Yorkshire. Thanks. Um, I've got a slight technical actually, but anyway, I think we've got quite a lot of um, conversation uh, questions around policing. So I'm wondering whether we could just cover a few of those off, Lisa, whilst we're on this topic, rather than waiting till the end. If that would be all right. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Okay. So um, we've got um, uh, quite a lot of conversations about uh, questions about the safety camera vans um, and whether they are still fully operational. Um, uh, uh, so that's one. Um, and then uh, one about uh, speed awareness courses uh, because they're not running and what to do about those. Uh, and then we've got a number of uh, sort of health and safety concerns around the well-being of police officers, but also their interaction with the public and the use of things like sort of hand, hand sanitizer and touching driving licenses and those sorts of things. So I'll start off with those, if that's all right. OK, so um, I haven't actually got the questions in front of me, a bit of a technical technical matter for myself here at this end, but I don't want to press anything and, and cut everybody off. So when. Um, um, I'll try and remember some of those, but uh, please remind me as we go through. So in terms of the safety camera vans, uh, yes, they are still out, but being deployed from an intelligence basis. Um, so we've had quite a lot of members of the public contacting us saying they're very concerned about people using our more than usual empty roads as racing tracks, putting other people at risk. Uh, I think people might have seen in the media there was somebody prosecuted for 130 miles an hour just recently and um, so we are responding to those calls by placing the safety camera vans out on our, our at-risk country roads where people are flouting the law and putting other road users at risk. We absolutely want to protect people on our roads and keep them safe and we can only do that if we tackle those uh, who are not abiding by the law and putting others at risk. We want to protect our National Health Service from those terrible um, collisions that can happen as a result of that speed. We also use our safety camera vans with AMPR capability. So they're also protecting people from criminal use of our roads. So they're being used in a limited way uh, based on that uh, wider protection of the public in this time of crisis. Linked to that, clearly um, speed awareness courses have been ceased for uh, public health reasons. And therefore, um, we are only using the legislation in terms of prosecution uh, in cases of um, speeding on our roads at the moment. Uh, so hopefully that covers off the safety camera van and um, speed awareness course issue that was raised. Um, I think there was a mention there about uh, officer safety and PPE. There is a national programme running to replenish 
uh, the required PPE, so that public um, personal protective equipment, should I say, for our officers, it's available to them. They've been uh, given Public Health England advice about how and when to use that PPE in circumstances when they respond to calls for service. Absolutely, the health and welfare of our staff is paramount. Um, if we can keep our staff safe, we can come out and help you uh, to stay safe as a community. Uh, thanks, Lisa. So could you just um, give, I'm just conscious of time and we've got a lot to go through, but could you just give a little bit of a flavour of how you're dealing with young people? Because we've got quite a lot of questions around uh, what the public should do if they see groups of young people and how the police are dealing with young young people. Could you just very briefly just talk about that? Absolutely. So um, going back to the reason we're all here in partnership with this um, situation, this is an unprecedented health crisis. And therefore, our job is to protect people from the spread of the virus so that we keep them safe, we save lives and we protect the NHS. And that's the message for our young people also. So those young people who understandably might not understand the gravity of the situation, going out and meeting friends, um, please, please stay at home. Uh, for your own health and for those you might spread it to. Therefore, we are um, happy for people to contact us with that information. We can go and engage from a safe distance and trying to explain to those young people the risks. And also we are engaging with people's parents so that parents can advise their children and we can encourage those children and those parents to stay at home together, know where your children are. And it's really important we also engage with our peer groups Obviously, Youth Commission have done some great work um, of peer-to-peer -peer understanding of the risks that people are in so that we want to engage with young people, remind them they too have a part to play in the community of keeping our community safe. So basically, people, if they've got some concerns, call 101 and the police will go and, uh, and deal with it as appropriately. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, please. OK, great. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, OK. Um, uh, Richard, um, um, if I, I, I think before we get into fire and some of the other things, it would be really helpful if you could um, just talk a little bit about what the LFR, LRF structures are, so people understand how how the different agencies, the different people are working together to try and uh, keep us all safe because I think it's complicated and people don't quite know who does what and it'd be really helpful for you just to explain that quickly if that's okay. Yes, happy to do that Julia. It is complicated and uh, it's unusual so it doesn't happen all the time but in North Yorkshire we've got a little bit of experience of this because the LRF will come together in emergencies typically like flooding so having a, a really serious health emergency like this is very unusual for us, but the same principles apply. So all of the uh, res key responders to an emergency, police, fire, ambulance, county council, district councils, uh, health colleagues, all come together. And it's a means of being able to coordinate activities so that we understand what everybody's doing. We understand the problem in hand. We can try and collectively look ahead at the key issues that are coming our way, coordinate our activities together, have an interface crucially between the local area and governments and even into the military that if we need help and assistance we can speak as one voice and to get that assistance to come forward. But it's a really important uh, coordination tool, everybody buys into it really well, uh, agencies um, operate it really effectively the goal in terms of this current emergency is being operated by the Assistant Chief Constable Mike Walker. Uh, he's doing a really good job of making sure that agencies stay together and on uh, and works those good meetings well. We've pulled together a coordinating unit based at County Hall in North Allerton, and that's got emergency planners, military planners, key specialists looking at really important issues such as NHS capacity. Um, and they're working together and then linking in virtually to many other colleagues to make sure we all understand the situation. 
Okay, thank you. And can I, I know, now I know there's some nervousness ar around this question that I'm going to ask. So, um, but can you sort of um, give the public that we get a lot of information, don't we, from London and from on the national media about what's going on. And I suppose, can you try and put some of that in a local context for North Yorkshire um, around, you know, the sort of rates of infection and what we're to expect and, and all of the rest of it? Um, because Because we keep hearing that we're you know, so many weeks behind London, and we, but we, and we see all of that. But I think it's quite hard for people to put that in their their local context. It is, Julia. Yes, and um, <clears throat> and I suppose we're all trying to work out collectively together how this virus does operate in in different environments. So clearly, in a large city uh, uh, environment such as London, then there's so much opportunity for. Uh, the infection to uh, the uh, virus to root itself in different parts of the community and to transmit itself very quickly, um, particularly when it's at an undetected stage. And that seems to have been what's happened um, at London. So therefore, it will be more, uh, it will uh, all of the uh, um, levels of cases and unfortunately deaths will progress quite quickly. In North Yorkshire, we are behind that. Um, and the transmission mechanisms in North Yorkshire will not operate in exactly the same way. We are a rural community, and that's to our benefit in terms of um, how the disease might uh, pass between uh, people. Uh, on the other hand, we are a more aged community as well in North Yorkshire, so there are uh, perhaps more vulnerabilities in terms of people we've got to shield and worry about in terms of how the virus progresses. But you're right, the modelling of which there's been quite a lot of uh, variation on over recent weeks is showing that the national situation is likely to peak within the next one to two weeks. And then the North Yorkshire peak will be a couple of weeks further behind that. Um, quite what that level will be at the end of the day, we don't know. Uh, the recent modelling has pulled that back a little bit in terms of some very serious scenarios we're looking at but it's still looking like it's going to be a very very serious issue for North Yorkshire as well as the rest of the county hence reinforcing all of the messages that Lisa made about the need for us to make sure that we're self-isolating staying at home not going out to less emer uh, emergency journeys. Uh, does, does that provide the explanation Julia that you're looking for? Yeah I think that's that's really uh, uh, helpful and of course you know, the peak that we see in the hospitals is is different to the peak of infections. And I think people just need to remember that the infections come before the hospital admissions. And so, you know, it's really, really, really important to people to stay at home and not pass this virus on to uh, our friends and family and, and all of the rest of it. Um, I, 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 and particularly with Easter coming up, it's very difficult. We all want to be together, don't we, uh, over Easter and enjoy the holidays. But but this year, that is not really an option. That's absolutely right, Julia. And the thing I think for us all to recognise is that the data we get on numbers of cases are the cases in hospitals. So that's um, around the 200 mark. But there are many, many more cases out there in the community so it will be typically 10 or, or even a larger factor greater in terms of numbers of cases in the community. So North Yorkshire has a really extensive and wide problem. So every part of the county is touched by this and therefore everybody needs to follow the advice that you're giving there. Super. OK, thank you. Um, so um, I think... Um, uh, if, if it's OK, Richard, is there anything else that you want to uh, say in regards to the work that you're doing, think, things that you think the, the, the public need to know at the moment? Well, I think um, one of the things that I would say is that um, uh, I want to really just um, commend some of my own staff, if I can take that opportunity, Julia. We, we, one of the key missions that we have at the moment is to try and protect NHS capacity so I've got a, 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 well, teams and teams of brilliant social care workers trying to make sure we look after people at home. We get people discharged from hospital and we're able to look after uh, people in the community. So I, I want to thank them. I also want to give a message out to the broader community that we 
do have a network in place to look after people who are self-isolating, uh, they may be on their own, uh, and in order to look after them and how they're going to cope through these difficult weeks. So I suppose what we've got is a tiered approach where the first tier are friends, family, and some of those really brilliant local groups that are setting up in villages and streets to look after neighbours. So we're not getting in the way of them. They're doing a fantastic job and I really commend them. What we are doing, though, is that we're establishing a network of 23 voluntary and community organisations at a much larger scale underneath that. And with our contact centre and other paid staff supporting, we will be able to get out to anybody who thinks that they, they don't want to leave their home and they're worried about prescriptions or food. And if anybody is in that category, Julia, then if they ring the county council contact centre, which is 01609 780 780, then we would be able to help them and connect them to the volunteers to deal with the issues that they're facing. That that is really really helpful. Thank you, uh, Richard. Um, just um, interestingly, I mean, Sarah. Lisa, Andrew, and yourself, Richard, would all be working with volunteers. What has been the volunteer response like in, in, in North Yorkshire? Well, just quickly from my perspective, uh, Julie, it's been brilliant. At those many different levels, so really informal vol volunteering where people just pitch in and help their neighbours, right through to people coming forward to help our local community organisations. And then, of course, there's a big chunk of people who are part of that three quarters of a million people nationally who volunteered to help the NHS. And we're getting access locally now to some of those volunteers to help out with that uh, supporting operation of people in the community and to shield those who are the most vulnerable. So we, we, we often talk a little bit about people who are flouting the don't, the don't go out and the stay at home. But I think we also need to recognize the, the brilliant nature of our communities in North Yorkshire and how people step forward to look after other people. So it's a real, a real positive about being in North Yorkshire at this time. So I was also very pleased to see on Google that uh, Rydale is one of the areas in the country that has been uh, most uh, <laughs> compliant with the government's instructions. So that was good to good to see. Um, Sarah, you're the chief executive of IDAS, our domestic abuse uh, service provider. You, you, you must use volunteers as well. Absolutely, Julia. Volunteers are crucial to the services that we provide. Um, we use volunteers to help support the work of our paid practitioners and paid professionals. So they help with our live chat services. They help in our refuges, do all sorts of practical tasks. And I think just to, to reinforce what Richard has said, we've had so many lovely offers of people wanting to volunteer. It's a little bit difficult at the moment with self-isolation rules, thinking about how we can best use volunteers. But there's so much goodwill, I think, that, that people have shown over the last few weeks. It, it's incredible. And Andrew, can I, I might just uh, bring, bring you in a little bit on here, because um, obviously we have... Um, uh, our on-call firefighters, but also uh, volunteers in the fire and rescue service as well. Yes, so we uh, put out a plea for volunteers from within our own workforce, uh, and we've got uh, almost 100 people come forward and offer themselves up to do additional types of work outside their normal role. And certainly uh, amongst our full-time firefighting workforce on stations, they're finding lots of local opportunities to assist in their community and working through Richard and the local resilience forum, identifying coordinated activities that we can do across the whole of York and North Yorkshire. Lisa? Um, yes, we have a very strong history, obviously, in policing and volunteering right through from our special constabulary uh, through to police support volunteers and people who are connected to policing like Neighbourhood Watch and other volunteer organisations that we work closely with. Um, a huge thank you to all of those people. We've had an overwhelming response of people contacting us, wanting to come and help and assist and people who want to come back to policing that might have um, policed in the past and have retired. And we are working very closely in partnership uh, with some of the work uh, Richard talked about uh, with local authority, with other agencies to make sure that we can make best use of that volunteering 
offer out in our communities where the need is greatest. Thank you. So I think we need to give one big wholehearted thank you to the public for their response to this because it sounds as if it's been fantastic. So thank you. Um, OK, so um, uh, Andrew, do you have a fire update for us? Would that be possible, please? Yes, I do. Uh, I'll go through it alongside John Foster, the um, uh, other chief officer on the team. Uh, so I'll start it off with um, first, really, a thanks, like Richard did to his workforce, uh, a thanks from us to our workforce who are really pulling out all the stops during this particular crisis uh, and doing everything that they can to reasonably protect their community and look after them. Uh, we have had an impact on our staffing, uh, but self-isolation amongst our staff remains low. It's about 5% and those numbers are, are certainly stable and beginning to fall. Uh, working from home is enabled for everybody who can. Clearly, our firefighters and our other frontline staff can't do their jobs from home, but they're going into work and they are able to deliver. Everybody else is working from home who can work from home. And we are bringing forward plans to introduce video conferencing facilities at all of our fire stations to improve communications between us and our staff and between our staff and their ability to communicate with communities. Day-to-day uh, -day business has been disrupted to an extent because we've had to take time to adapt our ways of working and to contribute heavily to the local, regional and national meetings and the planning systems that are in place for that. So there will be some longer term impact because we'll have to catch up on some of the things that we're not able to do at the moment, such as some training, some recruitment and filling some of the vacancies that we have within the service. So that's the kind of impact on staffing. But in terms of the maintenance of our ability to deliver services, I'm going to pass you across now to John Foster, who will talk about that. OK, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, so we, uh, w when this outbreak it came on to us, one of our main priorities was that we would maintain our full availability to respond to emergency incidents. And I'm pleased to announce that we are able to do that. Uh, our availability, appliance availability levels are improved to the work they would normally be. And this is largely due to our on-call staff that have now got to uh, stay at home uh, from their primary, primary employment, which means that they're now available for us to respond to incidents, which is a real positive. Um, we have put some additional resources into Harrogate, and that is to support the Nightingale Hospital that's located there now. So we've now got a dedicated fire engine for the duration of this um, pandemic with an additional resource in at Harrogate to, to support any other confirmed fires within the area. So uh, a reassurance really to the residents of Harrogate that whilst we've got a dedicated fire engine looking after the uh, Nightingale Hospital, we will respond as normal to all other incidents in the Harrogate area and beyond. Um, we changed our routine training schedule. So uh, we can uh, do more training now virtually, making use of IT, uh, and also we've got training centre staff now going out to the fire stations and delivering training there, as opposed to coming into the training centre. Um, we've identified alternative buildings to use as temporary fire stations, and this is just in case we have to vacate any of our fire stations for deep cleaning. Um, so we've got that underway now. We've identified those places, so we're ready should we have to do that. Uh, we've got an enhanced program to practice our resilience arrangements with our partner control room. So um, we have a, a, an arrangement with Cornwall so that they can handle some of our emergency calls and similarly back the other way. And now our, uh, we've, we've increased our training there so that we're well practiced on that. And within the um, control environment, which is a very... Um, precious environment, shall we say, because it's very difficult to replace control staff. We've now engaged seven former employees. They've received training and they're happy and able to come in and support the control room function should we need them. Um, and um, just back to what Richard was saying previously, we're now fully engaged at all levels of the local resilience forum. Um, our ability to... Um, uh, demand, sorry, the, our, our availability and demand of incidents has, has increased in certain areas. Uh, and one in particular, we are dealing with dozens more fires in gardens and open spaces than we would normally be at this time of year. 
and some unfortunately are spreading to other buildings like sheds and garages so we really urge people to be careful at home and please please don't have bonfires at home during this period i recognize that the amenity centers aren't open and the uh, the assisted the, the wheelie bin for the green waste has been uh, suspended for a period of time this is impacting on our delivery uh, by more people choosing to have bonfires we urge people not to do that um we also appear to be attending more fires in the home and we feel that this is caused by distraction and carelessness some examples are uh, trays left on hobs uh, we had a recent incident of a teddy bear left on a table lamp an ashtray fell off a sofa arm into a waste bin. Fortunately, we were able to deal with these before they got serious, but uh, these are just examples of the type of thing that can happen if people are being careless. Um, interestingly, with less vehicles on the roads, we're attending less um, road traffic collisions at the moment. There are fewer of those for us to attend, but uh, you know, those that we are attending, uh, no doubt will be uh, increased in severity if we don't combat the speeding. Um, automatic fire alarms in commercial premises and care homes largely remain about the same as they were previously. And really, it's too early to uh, provide a full detailed trend line, but we are working on this over the next fortnight so that we can analyse the real impact on our demand. But above all, we urge members of the public to take care and to share our safety messages with family and friends. And please take care out there. Uh, thank you. So, uh, sorry, just um, can I just ask quickly, um, how are you uh, supporting practically your um, your other uh, emergency responder colleagues? So ambulance, police, the local authorities. How are you pr practically? What are the things that you're doing in terms of getting out and about into communities to help? Andrew, um Okay, so, so there's a number of things happening there. So we've, we've got arrangements now in place. Um, so operational crews are out and uh, delivering food for the vulnerable. They're helping um, with uh, pharmacies with delivery of prescriptions out to uh, people that need prescriptions delivering. So a whole range of um, different styles of activity uh, where um, mo um, identifying those vulnerable from the 1.5 million within the uh, identified category and we're making where we can we're making sure that we're phoning people we are offering support and advice over the phone uh, to make sure, sure that their fire safety side of things is, is dealt with adequately within the home um, we have got uh, resources now helping the ambulance service but i think we're coming on to that later on um, with a, a separate presentation Okay. Um, uh, okay, that's that's fine. Um, I'm 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 wanting to avoid slides if at all possible, um, and just and have verbal presentations if that's all right. Fine. Yeah. 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 Great. Super. Um. So we've just had lots of questions in to talk about talking about PPE, which is obviously a subject of discussion in the media. Richard, do you want to talk, start with that from? From your point of view, and then we'll perhaps ask uh, uh, police and, and fire about some specifics in their services. Yeah, just to say, Julia, that it is a challenging uh, issue, the provision of PPE. I think it's one of the one of the high risk areas that we've identified with the LRF. Uh, we're trying uh, to engage with the national stops and to make sure that we get deliveries in the next few days to try and help the condition overall. Um, the situation is that most agencies, and certainly the County Council point of view, we, we are coping, we have enough at the moment, but stops are uh, being used constantly and we do need new deliveries in place. I'd also like to mention some for future businesses. We've certainly been put on to do suppliers of face masks to for future businesses, great in Skipton who's fly in those as well. So been innovative in trying to source PPE. It remains a challenging area because now our web has to be completely on top and making sure that other key parts of the Richard, we're just losing the sound a little bit. Not sure why. Is that everybody else got that problem or is it just me? <laughs> 
Okay, shall I? Did you get the that, response? That's much better. Oh, all right, let me go through that again. I was saying the, the, um, the PPE is a big issue for the LRF. Um, we, we need to get more supplies in nationally. We are working on that. Agencies at the moment have um, stocks for their immediate needs. But we do need to replenish those supplies. And we need to think about other parts of our uh, provider community, such as care homes as well, who are less visible than many of the parts of the NHS, for example. So we're working on it through the LRF. It's a, uh, an issue we need to keep on top of as a, as a key priority. Fantastic. Uh, Lisa, do you want to uh, just uh, come in on that as well, please? Yes, yeah, so briefly, the police um, personal protective equipment is being coordinated nationally now and centrally, uh, so people can put orders in. Every force has got a single point of contact that is keeping uh, a watch on the amount of PPE that's uh, being issued and used so that we can replace it. Um, so in, here in North Yorkshire, we have a good supply of PPE for our officers and staff. It is out on the ground. Chief officers have been out to, to, to various sites and checked its existence and that staff are um, having the right access to it. So officers and staff are taking it out with them on the ground. And we are always heeding the additional Public Health England advice that comes. So you may see officers that can't operate that social distancing of two metres using masks in certain circumstances, uh, which shouldn't be alarming that they're, they're trying to, to prevent the spread of the virus. Fantastic. Uh, Andrew, John, do you want to come in on uh, on that just from a fire service point of view, please? Yes, I can talk about that, Julia. Uh, it's not always straightforward to get the recommended PPE um, because there's so much demand nationally for it. But we, uh, similarly to the police, have got national uh, networks through the National Fire Chiefs Council uh, and the procurement and the uh, sharing of that PPE is being done through there. But we also have the benefit, of course, of our, our joint transport and logistics hub between fire and police. So our head of assets is working with the teams in there to make sure that we've got access to that PPE. But as a fire and rescue service, we've got the ultimate PPE really for uh, being able to deal with most things, hazmat suits and and our breathing sets. Now, clearly, we would rather not be having to put them on to deal with lower level hazards, but ultimately we can do if it came down to it. Uh, and certainly that's the sort of thing that we're looking at in the intervening period before we get full access to all of the PPE that might be recommended. Uh, so it's not a straightforward issue, but it is one that we're managing well. Fantastic. Thank you. So um, I'm just going to um, take us back to the agenda uh, now. And we've got uh, domestic abuse as the sort of main topic. We've got about 20 minutes left on the call. Um, the, the, it's quite useful um, having all the agencies here because quite a, most people have something to do with domestic abuse and supporting domestic abuse. And obviously it's a conversation that's been had through the LRF structures around uh, accommodation for survivors and all of the rest of it. So um, Lisa, do you want to just start off by what we're seeing sort of coming in the front door, if you like? So the the the, the policing element of it. And then um, I'll bring um, uh, Sarah in and then Richard, if there's something you want to sort of add to add to that at the end, that'd be really uh, helpful. So Lisa, if you want to just give us a start, just we've got about 10 minutes for this. Thanks. Thank you, Julia. And, and, and if I may, um, Annette Anderson, our Assistant Chief Constable, who leads for us on safeguarding and works across those partnerships is online uh, with, a, with a detailed update for us, if I can hand over to Annette uh, to provide that information um, out to those watching. Okay, um, good afternoon everybody. Um, so we've also got Detective Superintendent Alan Harder, who is the Head of Safeguarding online as well, also to answer any questions. Um, but before the outbreak of the virus in the UK and before restrictions were put in place, we knew from other countries that there was an indication there would be an increase in domestic um, abuse, with some of them seeing incidents um, with a threefold increase particularly during the periods of self-isolation and lockdown. We know with the additional financial pressures, children off schools, restrictions in movements, and just spending more time together indoors, 
that all of that is going to create extra pressure um, on families. So in preparation already, policing leads both nationally and locally, we've been working hard with College of Policing and the Home Office to be prepared about and provide guide, guidance in relation to um, our preparations. Um, and we know that being at home is not always safe. So all, already those um, uh, domestic abuse victims um, that have already suffered um, would be maybe at further risk because of that and also because of the current pressures um, as I've explained because of COVID. So nationally there has been a gold group um, which is a team of leader, senior leaders within different organisations. So we are linked into the daily updates from the regional and, and national domestic abuse coordinator also with other um, criminal justice organisations such as the CPS um, and um, access to courts. So there's a lot of work in preparation um, uh, for the potential increase. So here locally in North Yorkshire Police, we've been having daily monitoring of all domestic abuse incidents and crimes. So far, we have not seen an increase in incidents or crimes. However, really important that that does not mean that victims and families are at risk and because they may not call the police or there are other agencies such as refuge that we have known has seen an increase um, nationally in calls for help so also we've also been monitoring um, if um, there are changes in particular themes such as children as offenders as we say teenagers um, are in houses, cooped up all day, and all of that causes added stress. So we've really been focusing on any changes. Um, we've been particularly focused on a campaign. So we know that victims who need help, support and protection have a range of ways of access to service. So if they don't feel comfortable calling police, that there are other measures in place. So um, locally, again, we have been um, doing lots of messages in different formats to raise awareness. And that's been through um, social media and through other um, comms teams, particularly around safety advice, um, working closely with IDAS, which is we've got um, online as well, the Independent Domestic Abuse Services. Um, and hopefully she'll explain a little bit more about the live chat which is promoted daily when there's an extended service. In terms of our domestic abuse officers and staffing levels, I'm really pleased to say that we've been able to maintain um, our service. And I can absolutely assure the public that, and pe people who um, are suffering from domestic abuse, that we will provide the service and attend incidents. So there's not going to be any change um, to that and they'll get a high standard of service from us. Um, there are also um, other sort of initiatives in place. So for example, if somebody does call 999, they're unable to speak, um, they can either cough or dial 55 and our operators are trained to know that this means that you need help and assistance. So again, it's just a real plea to uh, the public. Um, and um, the other um, areas that we've been working with is that we have still maintained our service to high um, risk um, and those at high risk, such as our Marrick, which again is a multi-agency approach to protect those at high risk um, of harm. And also um, another um, forum called MATAC, which is working with offenders, again, to reduce the offenders, which has been really, really um, beneficial and positive in North Yorkshire. And working with our partners, um, again, is, is we've been working very closely with them to make sure that we have um, can assess uh, the demands and the risks. So we've got referrals to drug and alcohol services, working closely with children and adult social care to make sure that children are protected in the household during this crisis. We're also mindful about the mental health service that we have. And, um, and again, we are really um, mindful about working with other criminal justice um, agencies such as the CPS. So we are able to maintain as much as possible.
Fantastic, Annette. So um, in a nutshell, then, the demand, we're not seeing increases in demand no. uh, and you are uh, fully able and willing to uh, support the public in this and services are operating um, as we would um, expect them to be. So that is really uh, good, good, good to uh, hear. Sarah, can I can I bring you in now, please? Um, uh, would that be OK? Because I think it would yeah. be really good to hear sort of from the front line at the experiences of, of, of people um, and how you're supporting people. Thanks, Julia. And that's given a really good summary of all of the sorts of ways that uh, the police and the agencies are trying to engage with victims in their homes. Obviously, for us, it's very difficult to get the message directly into people's homes. So we're doing as much as we can on radio, social media, any sort of mechanism. We're going to be putting some posters out there in chemists and in um, supermarkets and things like that just to try to engage with people. Um, our experience of the numbers of people contacting us is that we're starting now to see an increase. So... Uh, from in terms of the first two weeks when the virus started to spread, we did see a reduction, I think, in the people accessing the helpline. But since we've done some promotional work on the helpline and live chat, we're seeing three times as many people coming through our live chat service. So people are finding that space and able to reach out to us confidentially, which is, is great to know. We anticipate that it will be towards the end of the um crisis that people start to seek more support having been isolated for maybe two three months uh, with a, with an abuser that when they've got that access then that they can come out back into the community and start to reach out for support that that's the time that they will do so so we think that we will see a huge increase in calls to our helpline a huge increase in referrals for refuge space and for community-based support probably within three to six months more than straight away Okay, so that's that's really helpful. So um, the um, it, I think one of the things that um, so I'm involved in this uh, quite a lot at a national level, and one of the things that we've been thinking about is um, it's, it's obviously very difficult if you're stuck in a house with a perpetrator, to actually trying to find the space to get into contact with some support services, um, and the the ability of uh, online to be more dis, a dis, more discreet channel for people, um, and so um, wondering whether or not we should be doing some sort of advertising around on Facebook around. You know, services are open at usual. It's normal. This is where you go. This is how you get support. And just thinking about how we use digital channels to make sure that people are aware that services are up and running and they can get support. Sorry, Julie, was that a question for me? I just lost you well, there a minute. It's just I just wonder whether that type of activity will be we should be looking at those types of activities more than we are doing at the moment, because sort of thinking quite traditionally about GP surgeries, supermarkets and all of that sort of stuff. But actually, you know, a lot of people will be online and they can they can hide in plain sight a little bit more online sometimes. Absolutely. I think online is a massive forum. It's a brilliant means to get the messages out there. Um, I think Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, doing things like this are very engaging for people. Also using the radio. I'd like to see the government doing a kind of a TV uh, broadcast and, and campaign as well, ideally, because I think those those means of getting messages directly into people's homes are obviously so vital at the moment, particularly. Fantastic, Sarah. And Will, did you have a, a question? Sorry, yeah, my question was, given we all expect domestic abuse to increase for lots of reasons, at what point do we get worried where demand doesn't seem to have gone up as much as we would expect and where you sort of think well, we have to try a bit more proactively to help people who feel helpless? Um, I, that's a really interesting question, Will, isn't it? I think, yes, uh, if, if, if the figures are correct that are coming from other countries and we're expecting bit increases of, of uh, sort of I don't know three times as many reports as we have been getting then it would be very concerning if we didn't start to see an increase in the demand for helplines and live chat um, I think it comes back to Julia's point really that the mess getting the message out there into people's homes using social media using radio and, and other broadcast media is absolutely vital um, so that we know that we're doing all that we can 
I think a big concern, of course, is in rural areas where people perhaps are even more isolated and will continue to be isolated even after COVID is, is, is uh, over. So it, it's a challenge for us, isn't it? And we just need to keep monitoring the, the figures as they come in, I think. Okay, so that's that's really helpful. So the, the message really is that is important, I think, for people to understand is that services are there, are, are in place, the police are there, it's all there. And if you need it, please make contact in the various different ways that are, are, are available um, and you will be supported and you will be helped. Absolutely, that's the vital message to get out there. Okay. Um, which is very difficult for people who have been told to stay at home as well. So there's tend to sort of conflict in mis perhaps in messages there. Um, so um, Andrew, um, did you did you want to? Uh, can I can I bring you in now as well around um, uh, your update, particularly about the domestic abuse agenda? Did, yeah, did you have something? Did you have something to 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 well, contribute? I thought it was just it was just a minor point. Often arson is used as a threat against victims of abuse. And it's just reassurance to anybody who might fear that we aren't operating normally. We will absolutely come out and help anybody who has any threats of arson made against them uh, and make sure that they've got all of the safety equipment that we can provide in place. Because the threat of arson is uh, on a victim is so great that the coronavirus certainly won't be enough to stop us from going out to help those people. That's as much as I wanted to add to that, really, Julia. That, that, that's really helpful, um, Andrew. Thank you. And um, uh, just to be uh, clear, uh, that the support agencies' uh, details are on the North Yorkshire Police website and also on IDAS, which is uh, idas.org.uk. Uh, is that right, Sarah? I think that's right, isn't it? Yeah. Um, That's right. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Rich, did you want to come in and talk about children in social care as well in respect to this? Yes. Yes, Julia. It plays into this. Some of the uh, same issues apply here. So we've got our frontline uh, social workers are still going out, visiting families and um, catching up and checking out with uh, how children are doing in some very difficult uh, domestic circumstances. What we are seeing, I don't believe it's very early days yet, but there's a slight rise in numbers of uh, children coming into care. So it's showing some of that stress and perhaps people reaching crisis points in families uh, as a consequence of some of the measures that we're having to put in place. So it is early days yet, but it's a, 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 a story that I was picking up talking to frontline managers yesterday. So we'll need to watch that make sure that children are safe through this period. Also, just because online has been mentioned, we're, we're really keen to make sure that parents absolutely know what their children are doing online at this moment in time. There can be long periods of time where uh, kids will be on computers, etc. And we all know that there's opportunities for things to go wrong there. So it's a strong message to parents to make sure you understand who your children are engaging with online as well. Thank you for that, Richard. I think that is a really, uh, really, a really important message. Um, um, I just, I just wonder also how, because um, a lot of these issues that we're talking about are interrelated between all of our different agencies here. And I know we have in normal times the structures in place um, to sort of swap data and information. Um, but I think that type of insight, Richard, is really, really interesting um, to sort of feed back up the, 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 the sort of food chain into government. So, for example, I have a weekly meeting with uh, Victoria Atkins, the minister in, uh, uh, who has responsibility for domestic abuse. And that, that type of insight could, could be really helpful to uh, to policymakers and to ministers. So I'm really keen to try and get the information that's coming up from the the front line to 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 try and collate it and to try and get a sense of a picture of of, of what is happening around vulnerability uh, uh, as we would call it, and to try and um, sort of make sure that uh, across the piece we are providing that information um, in as timely a way as possible. Um, so I don't know. 
out with of the sort of structures that you've got for dealing with the crisis, how we're sort of gathering this information and sharing it amongst partners? Uh, well, we clearly work very well together with uh, with uh, Lisa's teams linked into looking after children. So um, we will um, uh, send information through that route, Julia, or very happy to engage in your office directly and help make sure that people understand the dynamics that are in place here. That that'd be really helpful. I just it just starts to paint a really interesting picture of the impact that this is having on <laughs> on our communities and our and our families. I think. Yep, OK, thanks very much. Um, so um, have we got um, uh, I, there is another sort of fire update on the agenda, Andrew, which is about supporting other services. Do you and John did touch on that. Is there anything else that you want to uh, add to that? Uh, yes. So there was an agreement which many people will have seen uh, between national employers the National Fire Chiefs Council and the Fire Brigades Union about some additional activities that firefighters might undertake during this crisis. Uh, and it was about assisting the ambulance service, moving the dead, uh, sorry to be so crass if that was necessary, and being able to deliver essential things like, like uh, drugs from their chemist and food to the most vulnerable people in our communities. Um, so just to provide an update on what we are doing about that, all of our activities, we apply the same model to, we assess them and continue, or we assess and adapt and continue, uh, and we reevaluate that regularly, and that's what we continue to do around these particular uh, areas that were agreed between those three organisations. Um, so what we're asked to do when we get a request to do that type of thing is, is analyse what we're being asked to do, consider whether it's a reasonable ask of firefighters and what impact they will be able to have on the safety and the well-being of their community and if we're able to do it safely enough to protect our people to maintain their ability of course to still respond to emergencies and we've done that and we're now doing a lot of work out in communities uh, to help them. Uh, Richmond for example have been um, taking vegetable boxes out, they're now looking to do that at Tadcaster and at Tadcaster they're also working with with pharmacies to make sure that uh, people have got their essential drugs and that is spreading right across the county so firefighters are taking it upon themselves to work locally um, with their local organizations to identify why, where they can help uh, and also very importantly we are part of a Yorkshire and Humberside regional fire service approach to supporting the Yorkshire ambulance service so we got a request from the ambulance service uh, for people to drive the ambulances that will ferry people to and from the Nightingale Hospital in Harrogate. So we've now got 12 people who are trained from each fire and rescue service across the region, uh, including North Yorkshire, and they will start to do that work the moment that the Nightingale Hospital is up and running and operational. So um, we have, have also got a plan in place where we can expand the number of people who will be able to drive ambulances should that be a requirement by the ambulance service uh, and we're delighted to be able to support them at what at the moment is an absolute time of, of huge uh, call on their services at the moment and they can't reasonably be expected to deal with that on their own so we're delighted to be able to offer a few people in a small way as it is at the moment to be able to support that. Fantastic, thank you. So I'm just wanting to make sure that we've covered um, all of the uh, sort of general questions that we've we've had. Um, uh, so um, I, I think we probably have the only thing that possibly we haven't covered is 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 the um, abstraction rates and and illness rates in the police service, Lisa. If you do, you want to just pick that up uh, quickly. Yes, happy to cover that. Uh, it was covered in the Home Affairs Select Committee yesterday, so uh, it was on television and in the public domain. Uh, there's a, a higher national rate of abstraction at the moment. Um, we are lower than the national rates, so there's about 8% abstraction, but that ranges across people who are poorly, also along alongside people who are self-isolating. So there are still some people working at home, even though they're not physically in the workplace. And um, so I, I feel um, perfectly comfortable here in North Yorkshire that we have capacity uh, to continue with our normal service here in North Yorkshire at the moment. Hello. 
Hi, Lisa. We seem to have just lost the volume a little bit there. Um, so, um, are we, yeah, we have just slightly lost the volume there. Lisa, I just think, I suppose the only thing that I would like to add to that is uh, a reminder that uh, the to the public really that North Yorkshire Police are going to be out and about uh, mm -hmm. leading up to the weekend uh, uh, in the effort to uh, stop the spread of the virus and protect the NHS. So people be aware you will see a lot of police presence out and about in communities over the uh, coming week or so and certainly over the weekend. Um, has anybody um, got anything else they would like to add at this point? Um, uh, uh, if, if not, uh, we can uh, sign off. Does anybody else want to add anything? No? Okay, so we will answer specific questions uh, back to members of the public uh, directly. Um, and so the most important thing, uh, and you know I'm going to say this, but stay at home, save lives. Thank you very much.